You're a rat in a maze, a meaningless scavenger dwarfed in scale by mechanized skirmishes, skittering unnoticed as bullets land nearby, gathering what supplies you can before the heat comes your way, a combat ecosystem where being smarter is always preferable to being stronger, and where the war truly has a life of its own. When you start with a statement like, you aren't this guy, you're this guy, you're the smallest scavenger in a big war, and try to actually translate it through gameplay, it's an alluring idea and concept, but a complex one in execution. How did a tiny indie team take combined decades of AAA experience to try and curate an environment where set-piece moments happen naturally, entirely on their own? How do multitudes of complex mechanics intertwine, culminating in one simple, observable phenomenon? Creating a living battlefield isn't as simple as it sounds. Here's how the Forever Winter is going about making it real. An idea, a feeling. It's what carries any art form, it's what the creator of a work of art needs to try and transfer to its consumer. Ever since I started talking to these developers, it became clear that they agreed on one fact, that the idea to functionality pipeline was by far the most difficult one in games development. This video is a follow-up, by the way, to this one. If you haven't seen it, it details the studio's origins, some of the game's core lore and design components, and honestly, who the hell I am and why I care about the Forever Winter so much, how I became this game's combat journalist, so-called. If you've seen that video, this one will make a lot more sense, because now we are going to get into the nitty-gritty of it. But as I was saying, in games development, there's this concept, the door problem. Coined in 2014 by game designer Liz England, it basically says this, okay, you have a door, a simple aspect of architecture. We all know what purpose it serves in real life. But actually placing one, implementing a door in a game, creates potentially infinite complexities. Your game is a shooter, say. Enemies on one side of the door, player on the other. You want the player to enter through the door, kill the enemies in sequence on the other side, and venture through the next door, where more enemies await. But the player shoots the enemies from outside the door. They line up, aggroing the player, bottleneck in the doorway, and the player clears the whole level this way, without venturing once through that first door. The player being able to interact with the door is one thing. Getting them to interact with it in the way that you, the designer, want is another question entirely. Take that complexity and follow it. Apply it to every single item, idea, mechanic, anything the player might end up interacting with, witnessing, or being affected by. That's game development. So in this case, start with the bird's eye view idea. You are not this guy, you are this guy. Essentially, you're not the main character, you're the little guy. How do you actually get there? When you take the continuous shot from the end of Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men and say, I want the game to play like this scene, how do you actually do that? In a classic shooter level, the player is incentivized to move through the space, the objective being to turn it from an unsolved state to a solved one. I would even argue that multiplayer shooters are actually designed this way as well, incentivizing map control, steering the player forwards until they inherently lose that ground at some point so that they can move forward again. But when you design a level, a game mode, or AI dynamics in that way, where it revolves around the player's ability to solve the combat puzzle, you encourage action. The player very quickly becomes the guy. One option to dissuade this would be to completely script the game, an on-rails linear experience, essentially a playable movie. But where a linear single-player campaign would succeed in selling power dynamics through vignettes, it would fundamentally fail at delivering another key aspect, agency. In this situation, you've got to get creative. Take a concept, the Children of Men ending scene. What actually happens here? The protagonist needs to get to an objective. Two factions are fighting each other, and he's in the middle. The rebels want him dead, and the British army are shooting anything that moves. He carefully waits until the right moment where the two factions are just focused enough on each other that they don't view him as a target. He sprints from cover to cover. At certain point, he moves just at the right time, and at certain points, he's a little bit off. At no point in this scene does Clive Owen's character control anything other than his own autonomy. He sees a moment of opportunity, and he takes it. I've spent so much time building up the influence behind the creative decisions in the Forever Winter, not just because they're my own taste or I find them interesting, which is all true, but because these intricacies are this game. With the groundwork that they've put in up until now, Fundog Studios could release a Helldivers-esque extraction horde shooter today if they wanted. It would be easy, it would be derivative, and it would be the exact lack of boundary pushing that is the reason this company split from their various AAA backgrounds to create the game in the first place. All they'd have to do is take the whole AI system that I'm about to describe and turn it off. Now, 
None of this discussion today would be possible without the sponsor of this video, Manscaped, who were nice enough to send me over their new performance package. So let's see what's inside. Well, alongside some Crop Preserver deodorant, the Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion, the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and Nose Trimmer, some nice guides. The presentation overall is just lovely. We most importantly have the new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. This thing is basically the all-in-one platform for trimming and grooming. The improved interchangeable ceramic skin safe trimmer blade comes with a fixed 1.4 millimeter comb, which you can easily supplement with the included adjustable ones, allowing up to six more customizable lengths. And if you need to get down close, you pop that whole thing off and switch out for the included skin safe foil blade for the smoothest possible finish. The integrated LED light is multiple colors and the whole thing is compatible with USB 3.0 or wireless chargers. Point is, you got every possible need in an easy to travel with package. And if you want to get your hands on it, this as well as the included free gifts, of course, pair of boxers and that shed 2.0 travel bag, use my code in the description and the pinned comment for 20% off your whole purchase, as well as, of course, completely free international shipping. Thank you again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Early versions of the Forever Winter, like this years old proof of concept built in early Unreal Engine 4, were closer to standard co-op. The game was going to feature anecdotal situations from the game's lore, you'd control scavengers, attacking and looting a European convoy, you'd play as the kids with RPGs, fending off mechs, etc. You were still the little guy in every situation, but the game loop was much more traditional. Scripted, player-centered, great for storytelling, but you became the hero of every vignette. So. What if instead, what if the basic concept, you aren't this guy, you're this guy, was actually built into the game logic itself? Forever Winter is ruled by an AI director. Similarly to in games such as Left 4 Dead, it's the algorithm that oversees, simulates, and adapts the battlefield. Imagine it like a game board. When you spawn in, your objective is to traverse the map, loot, maybe complete a quest objective, and extract. But the two warring factions have their own spawn points, objectives, paths, and end goals. The game doesn't view you, the player, as unique or special in this ecosystem. You are simply one of the many entities on the battlefield, one of the pieces on the game board. Little interjection here, you can actually see the influence of this design aesthetically all over the game. Hexagonal trench lines, bunkers, and pathways all imitate that honeycomb layout of tabletop RPGs. I just thought that was a cool detail. Eurasian units enter the map from certain areas, and European units enter from others on the opposing side, and you spawn somewhere in between them. The armies move in to capture their objective points, individual units follow whatever their major orders are, and as they run into their enemy, they'll clash, creating natural points of contact. Everything is a roll of the dice from the AI director. But if you were to just throw a bunch of units and their objectives into a sandbox, what you get is a meaningless mash of combat. It's eventually just a wall of garbage, enemies punching, kicking, and shooting each other until one of their health pools happens to drain faster. That would have fundamentally disallowed the pacing required for the tactical push and pull between running and looting that the game wanted. It was exactly the scenario that Fundog needed to avoid. In this game, you'll often see the same units fighting each other in the same place, the same types of patrols. That's the reality of RNG with set parameters. But the entire battle will never, never play out the same way twice. That's partially because of those dice rolls from the AI director, but partially because of an interplay between two key mechanics acting somewhat independently of the director. The way that Fundog were able to make a game that actually feels like this. weight class and threat rating. Seemingly straightforward concepts that lead to infinite possibilities in practice. Weight class is the simplest. Like in the combat sports from which the name derives, it's the size or weight of a character, physically. This is pretty much fixed. A scav is the same class as standard infantry, who is slightly smaller than a machine gunner, who is roughly the same size as a brawler or a hunter killer, which is roughly the same class as a drone, which is smaller than an exo, which is roughly the same class as a main battle tank, which is smaller than a super hind, which is the same class as a medium mech. You get it, and it makes sense. Look at something and you can tell which weight class it probably falls into. Threat rating is relational. How much of a threat is one unit to another? This is in flux. It's both tied to weight class and simultaneously transcends it. Units tend to only engage other units that are at their same weight class, until one entity proves itself dangerous, essentially raising its threat level above its own weight class in comparison to another. Weight class and threat rating don't only dictate which units engage which and when, but how they go about doing so, with what level of effort they put into that fight. Take this medium mech, and as a main attack, its massive rifle, it'll use this against enemies at roughly its own weight class right off the bat, another mech or a hind. 
It also has shoulder-mounted defense cannons. It'll use these as a secondary attack, especially when it's outnumbered. But it also has a tertiary attack, its rear-facing rotary cannon. Not only does this weapon balance the mech from a physical design standpoint, that 120mm rifle must weigh several tons, but it's also a weapon that the media mech uses to defend itself against targets significantly under its weight class who are getting on its nerves, or, say, trying to sneak past it. Threat rating, like I said, is constantly in flux from one unit's relationship to those around it. Combining several smaller weight class enemies together brings their collective threat rating up to a higher level. One shotgunner, say, isn't an equal threat to an EXO. It would likely ignore this guy and focus on a target its own size, but if a whole fire team attack an EXO, Captain, Shock Troops, Automatic Rifleman, Sniper, they'll be perceived as a bigger threat, but the EXO still wouldn't use its main cannon against a target smaller than it. It'll use its machine guns and auto turrets instead. The heavier weapon a character uses, or even carries, will lead it to be being perceived as a bigger threat. The more damage done to a faction as a whole, the quicker that faction will recognize and attack the aggressor. As a player, you can spec yourself out with an understanding of these mechanics. Take a pistol or an SMG, and troops will not identify you as a major threat as quickly, for example. A character with a revolver might get entirely ignored by a fire team of infantry, but that same fire team might open direct fire on that same character if they were holding a grenade launcher instead, even if the one with the GL hadn't openly threatened the troops with it. The more an entity encroaches into a point of interest an army wants to protect, the better units that they'll send to defend it. AI will investigate sounds. UAVs, drones, and vehicles with thermal imaging will notice targets from a distance and send ground teams to investigate. And through it all over time, as the battle progresses, both armies will send larger and stronger units to the field to try and mop up. You might notice how I've been using terms like entity, units, etc., rather than saying you or the player or enemies here, and that's intentional. Because remember, the game doesn't care who's doing what, at least from an aggro standpoint. A faction might not know that you killed a European fire team in that moment. It just knows that a European fire team died over here. So guess what? Here comes a pack of cyborgs and an exo to go mess up whoever did that. But importantly as well, individual entities in the field only respond to what they can physically see or hear. Unless a UAV is spotted and tag you, or unless you're carrying a GPS-tracked piece of loot, enemies, whether tanks, exos, mechs, ground, or aerial forces, none of them literally know your location. They'll just naturally respond to what you do, the same as they would any other entity on the field. In many cases, units will see and acknowledge you, but if you haven't proven yourself a prior threat, if there's something nearby that has a higher rating than you, or if they have orders to go kill something, they'll pass you right by. Now, Every mechanic that I've been mentioning, weight class, threat rating, the pacing of aggro, characters different defensive and offensive capabilities, they all culminate together in one simple observable phenomenon that defines the symbiotic combat ecosystem. The solution to Forever Winter's question, how do you take you aren't this guy and translate it into gameplay? That feeling of huddling in a corner, sorting your inventory to patch yourself up as rockets impact just feet away, troops rushing past you just around a corner, the mad dash as bullets ping around you in every direction, making the decision to run straight towards enemy fire in the hopes that they engage the pursuers behind you, observing quietly from cover as units tear each other to pieces, waiting for that moment to strike when the winning side is at its least prepared. These are the moments that define the Forever Winter's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. These are the moments that are the result of pockets in combat. The phenomenon of either the presence or lack of active violence or danger in a given area at a given time. This is a pocket. How these pockets naturally rise, fall, and are dissected, shifted and interrupted, growing and dissolving as a result of every aforementioned mechanic, that's what you need to learn how to observe and then traverse intelligently. Observing pockets of combat as they form and soften is the key aspect of combat voyeurism the player needs to master to not get stomped into dust between the two warring militaries. How aggressively the player pushes their odds with them dictates how much danger they put themselves in. If you try to go in guns blazing, you versus Europa or Eurasia, you might take on a fire team, you might even live that round. You might even take out a couple tanks or an exo. But eventually, it'll all catch up with you. It's part of why the game is third person, by the way, and why I've actually urged the devs to remove the crosshairs. Remember the door problem. 
The player's point of view, their control input, the way the world is presented to them dictates how they're going to choose to interact with it. When you look at the world through iron sights, everything becomes a target. In staying true to its lore and themes, the game should reward intelligence over firepower. Take this simple moment, for example. I've been looking for drone components for a quest. I know that this exo down here has been scrapping drones and UAVs left and right, so I jump down and prepare to move on a dead one that it's recently killed. As soon as I see that it's actively engaging, I make my move, but it's not the right part that I need, so I quickly skitter away as the fight comes in my direction. There was about a five second window where this area right here was safe to loot, even though there were enemies right next to me. You can be trickier. Stick an IED behind an EXO, for example, or purposefully aggro a pack of cyborgs and then run them right into the opposing faction to pick up the scraps after the ensuing brawl. It's all up to how much you want to risk and how much you've figured out how to toy with these systems. This is the aspect of the game that struck me. That felt the most different when I first played a very early build months ago. That feeling that the world existed, fought, and died around me, but it wasn't about me. I was just there. There were all these instances when I first played with the CEO, Miles Williams, that made no sense based on my experience with other PvE games. I'd be healing in a trench as dozens of cyborgs sprinted past in the adjacent trench. How are we not completely overrun right now, I would ask. We're in a pocket, Miles would say to me. Or there was this moment in one of my first ever games. We were getting chased by a European Exo through a trench line. I get downed and I'm bleeding out. Miles books it away down the trench, the Exo and its supporting fire team close on his heels. Well, he's screwed, I say to myself. As Miles rounds the corner into a connecting trench system, he scrambles up and over the top. The EXO rounds the corner to where he should be and runs face first into a Eurasian fire team. A fight erupts. Miles dashes headlong across no man's land, dives back into the trench at our original position, and revives me. We were the target until we weren't. I've spent such a long time discussing the scenario system for a reason. It's the aspect of the game that, in my opinion, mechanically sets it apart from your average horde shooter or stealth game. It's also, though, emblematic of the tonal specificity that draws me into the game's world in the first place and what makes it feel alive and new, despite being a relatively simple idea at its core. The different characters and their unique abilities, the weapons, ammo, and customization system, the rigs, the looting of weapons and goods, crafting, trading, questing, even specific bosses and faction behavior, that's all icing on the cake that is the soul of what the Forever Winter is. A living art book, a dystopian nightmare diorama that you get to take a stroll through. The core ideas of the Forever Winter date back over a decade, when the team that is now called Fun Dog Studios was just four or five devs working here and there on Killzone or Horizon or Planetside or Deus Ex or Mass Effect. The actual build of the game that I've been playing in 2024, the one that you're seeing here, has barely been in development for give or take a year or two. I've seen many comments from people wishing that they could pilot the mechs in this game. They wish that it was first person, they wish that it was single player and story driven, or they wish that it was multiplayer PvP. They wish it was closer to this or that game that they know and love. The point that I hope I've made clear through explaining everything that I have today is that there's a reason that Fundog have designed the game in the way that they have. There's a specific tone and story that they want to push, but they're also grappling with the economy of time. How can we make sure that the ideas, mechanics, and aesthetics that carry the soul of the game hold steadfast with the little resources that we have on hand? There was a time when most games were a testbed for mechanics, for ideas, worlds, and aesthetics, not a rat race for who could make the most perfect, most 100% accessible, functional content, the most marketable and profitable product to sit on the shelves amongst many just like it. The former has become the exception, not the rule. It's why Fundog would like to ideally make the Forever Winters multiplayer peer-to-peer -peer where possible, why even in a markedly co-op game, you can completely play offline solo with a squad of Ghost Recon-esque bot partners. It's why they've set the game up so that even if it doesn't top the charts financially, it'll still be this little gem that anyone can seek out and dive into to its fullest extent from the day it's released until 20 years from then. And while many would disagree, I'd take a game like this over 10 perfectly optimized, polished, and tonally bland shooters any day. This is a game for 90s anime, sci-fi, dystopian fiction fans to geek out over. This is the OVA in the back corner of the video store. This is the heavy metal magazine in the middle of the pile on the bottom shelf in the library. It's the kind of media that maybe a lot of your friends don't really get what about it you're so into, but you just can't get enough of. The best art, in my opinion, gives you a direct line into the minds of the people who made it to see through their eyes, even if for just a moment. Ending our first meeting a couple months ago, Miles said to me, if people get to have an acid trip in a post-apocalyptic wonderland, that's a W for us. I don't know about you, but that's the game that I want to play. I'm Rilo, and I talk about things that I think are cool. Subscribe for more like this, and I'll catch you soon.